Welcome to Fiction and Story. We'd met at work quite accidentally. She was the owner's oldest daughter, but still his favorite little princess. At 22 years of age and a university graduate with some meaningless degree, she stood 5 foot 6 inches tall. Janet was every man's walking dream with a stunning body and smile that would melt an iceberg. She had long flowing blonde hair and the loveliest blue eyes ever seen. I was already in the lift coming back from lunch when she came running through the foyer to catch it. I guess she was in a hurry to meet with her father. As she entered the lift, she stumbled in her high heels and tripped, in the process falling all over me. We both ended up on the floor. I rose to my feet fairly quickly and helped her up then lent a hand to pick up the contents of her Mary Poppins sized handbag that had spilt. I was amazed at how much she could fit into it let alone have the strength to carry it. To be honest I'd seen her before and I was one of the besotted males who idolized her all the time knowing she didn't even see us when she walked past. I knew the floor she wanted and pushed the button and as the lift rose I continued to assist her. I was handing her the last of the contents of her handbag as the lift doors opened, and as I did so I looked into her beautiful eyes and smiled. She cocked her head then looked at my name badge then whispered, James Thomas. That was me. Such a sweet name. I like it. And turned then exited the lift leaving me standing there still smiling. Once she was out of the lift she turned and looked back at me as the doors shut. I was smitten. I was still smiling when the lift arrived back down on my floor, and I returned to my workstation not quite ready to unravel the mysteries of the accounting software package our company was interested in purchasing. Next day was payday, and I was about to go on lunch with some of my friends when she appeared at my desk and told me we had to hurry to get to our lunch booking on time. I was stunned and looked around seeing everyone around me staring at us, wondering how I'd managed to achieve the impossible and get a lunch date with the princess. Things moved quickly after that and within days I was called to the owner's office and told in no uncertain terms what would happen if I hurt his daughter. My job was being threatened because she seemed to like me. I'd studied four long hard years to obtain my degree and find a job I loved and didn't want to lose it. As it happened we clicked and got on so well, although I was kept poor keeping her in the manner in which she was accustomed. It wasn't that I was poorly paid but more a problem of where she wanted to go and how much places like that cost. I was ever mindful that if I pissed her off I'd lose my job, so I just put up with all of her demands. I should mention that she promised her parents she'd be a virgin when she married and stood steadfast by her word. That was frustrating, but it also meant no one else was getting any from her either. Almost six months to the day as we came out from lunch, she stopped in front of the large display window of a classy jewelry store just to look at dress rings. I'd only just managed to pay my credit card off and I knew I was in trouble. My recent rapid promotions at work had meant I was finally making more than she spent when we went out. Janet made some excuse to go inside, just to browse, and I stood with her as she tried on several nice pieces of jewelry, then somehow she ended up trying on engagement rings. Before long I knew her ring size, and the ring she loved. It was all happening very fast, but I'd planned to ask her in a few months anyway. I told her I needed to get back to work and as she turned without her noticing I motioned to the salesman to hold the ring and I'd be back shortly. I walked her to her car in our building car park, then after she left I walked back and somehow managed to purchase the ring she'd fallen in love with. Arriving back into work late, I bumped into her father who looked at his watch then raised his eyebrows at me. It's amazing what you can sometimes get away with at work when the boss's daughter loves you. It was now or never and stopped to talk with him. He was late for a meeting somewhere so as I asked if I could come over that evening to speak with him and his wife, I held the ring box in my hand. He smiled when he saw it and nodded and told me he'd see me for dinner with the family. I returned his nod knowing that dinner was served precisely at 8 every night. It was Wednesday so the whole family would be there as was their custom. Janet wouldn't know I'd be there until she came down from her room to eat. I always enjoyed eating with her family. Her sisters were a lot of fun and her mother and father liked me, I think. From the start, they'd certainly welcomed me in and treated me like a son they didn't have. My parents had died in car crash some years before and it felt good to be loved again. Janet was the oldest of three sisters and by far the prettiest. The next oldest was Debbie. She was exceptionally smart and although pretty in her own way was quite plain if she stood next to Janet. She was also a little chunkier with long mousy brown hair and brown eyes. It didn't take long to realize she had an abundance of personality and a loving nature. 
The youngest was many years their junior, and most probably an accident. She'd be a stunner like Janet when she was older. I liked Debbie a lot though, and quickly noticed she had to work so much harder than Janet to be accepted. She was doing IT at university, and unlike Janet, was looking forward to working in her father's company when she finished. If she had a boyfriend, I never heard her talk about him or saw him. Debbie was always underfoot asking so many questions involving concepts she was learning at university, particularly when Janet took her time to come downstairs. We got on so well and always had so much fun together, and sometimes I got the feeling I'd be more suited to Debbie. It was far too late to change ships in mid-ocean. Besides, I loved Janet, even though I always let her have her way and walk all over me. Janet was surprised to see me standing at the table waiting for her, and after everyone was seated their father told everyone he'd invited me. Dinner was nice, and the wine was something special brought up from his cellars, and when we finished eating I turned to her father. He'd obviously told Janet's mother why I was there, and she'd said nothing as well, but I could see her squeezing her husband's hand until it turned white. I smiled then politely asked him if he would allow me the pleasure of asking for Janet's hand in marriage. The three girls started squealing as their mother and father shed tears of joy, and then he told me I had their permission. As I turned to Janet, I took the box from my pocket and opened it as I asked her to marry me. After dinner, the women went into a huddle searching for the right date, and they decided to wait six months before we married. I assumed the women wanted enough time to organize everything, and as it happened, there was another big promotion for me. The wedding went off like a military operation any general would have been proud of. The service was flawless, and the reception was fit for a king. No expense was spared, and the meal was perfect. Janet wanted to spend our honeymoon in Hawaii, and was adamant we'd spend our first night as a married couple there so immediately after the cutting of the cake and changing into traveling clothes we were whisked away by limo to the airport to catch our flight. First class, of course. It cost me a bundle. As we boarded I noticed one of the caterers sitting much further back. He saw us and waved. I waved half-heartedly as I didn't like him when I'd met him and thought him sleazy. Janet thought he was cute, but all I saw was a predator. Halfway through the flight I started to feel unwell, and by the time we landed I'd used several sick bags. I'd never been airsick before so wondered if I'd caught or eaten something. There was a serious vomiting virus doing the rounds at work before I'd left and I decided it must have been it. But the time we'd signed in at the Hilton and gone to our honeymoon suite I knew I was in serious trouble. I could see Janet was distressed that I was so sick and that her perfect wedding night plans had been destroyed. The last thing I remember was having a shower to try to feel better than waking up in hospital with Janet beside me asleep on a chair. She woke with a start when I vomited into a bag, just as a doctor entered the private room. As he circled my bed to check me out, I saw my carry-on bag tucked into the wardrobe. Janet must have brought it up with some clothes and toiletries. He told me what I'd already suspected and that I had a serious strain of the vomiting virus. Maybe Janet had said something about it. I suggested to Janet that she catch a cab back to our hotel and shower and change then have something to eat before coming back up to join me. I could see she was worried by the tears in her eyes, but she agreed and left. I'd see her in a few hours. The doctor told me I should have started feeling much better, but I wasn't. The pain in my stomach was getting worse and now I was just vomiting bile. My stomach muscles hurt so much that when I had to vomit I felt like I was about to shed tears from the extreme pain. Before I'd met Janet I'd had a similar virus, but it felt nothing like what I was feeling now and started to think it felt more like when I'd eaten some bad chicken from the local deli and got really sick. I asked the doctor if it could have been food poisoning from the chicken I'd eaten at our wedding, but he told me Janet had already phoned her parents and all of her friends, and no one had food poisoning so that was unlikely. Then he reminded me that he was the doctor, and I'd do better to stick with my computers. Janet must have been doing a lot of talking since I'd collapsed. Janet never came back that night. She phoned after a late dinner saying she was tired, and would see me next day. I'd like to think that I dozed on and off, but usually it was the vomiting that woke me every time. I could see the doctor was worried and ordered blood tests and analysis of what I was bringing up. About the same time as the results came back I'd almost convinced him it could have been food poisoning. No matter what he gave to cure me nothing worked and I could tell he was getting frantic trying to think of something that could help me. No drugs seemed to be working. At least he was straight with me when he told me it was potentially getting more fatal every day. After lunch, Janet was with me again. 
She told me her body clock was confused by the different time zones. I could already see that although she was worried, she was really bored. Towards dinner time, she kissed me on the cheek and told me she had to get back to the hotel for dinner, as she had booked so I said goodnight just before I started vomiting bile again. I barely slept that night as the vomiting became much worse than finally I'd had enough, and next morning I bribed a nurse to find me some baking soda. She didn't ask why, but she easily agreed as I slipped a 50 into her hand and told me she'd be back after her lunch break. I could see the doctor was even more worried and said if I didn't improve soon my body would start to shut down. I really needed Janet with me, but she hadn't been back since the evening before. Finally she showed up, but seemed different somehow. I quickly picked up her mind was elsewhere. She didn't stay long, and I didn't even get a kiss before she said goodbye and walked out. She stopped and I heard her asking the doctor how much longer I'd be in for, and shook her head as he told her easily another week or more at a minimum. My bed was near a window, and I missed her so much, and wanted to see her as she caught a taxi back to our hotel. I leaned over as far as I could and watched, and waited then saw her walking down the path to the taxi rank. Then she waved. Except something was very wrong. She wasn't looking up at me, or even in my general direction, but at a man standing down near the taxis waving back. My heart hurt instantly from jealously, and then I recognized him. He was the sleaze from the catering company. The predator. The pain was too much when I saw them embrace before entering a waiting cab. The pain I felt then was worse than anything I'd felt so far. I must have been crying, or at least had tears in my eyes when my nurse appeared with my baking soda. She just stared blankly at me and told me she'd pass them as she came back from the shops. Then she said, she's not worth the pain. If she cared about you, she'd be here instead of out with Loverboy. Get the evidence while they both think you're here and they're not expecting it. She dug in her pocket and pulled out a card and handed it to me. Here's my brother's card. He's a good private investigator and his office is across the road. I'll get him right over here. He's sitting in his office doing nothing at the moment. I was just over there talking to him. Let him find out what's really going on and then you can decide what to do. Who knows? They might just be long lost cousins. I couldn't chase after her. I could barely move my arms let alone stand. I knew they weren't cousins and just thanked her then gave a weak smile as she used the phone beside my bed to call him. When she hung up I asked her to bring three cups of boiling water and a teaspoon as well as some extra bags to vomit into. She looked at me like I was mad but she did it. I dissolved a teaspoon of baking soda into each cup then waited until they were still hot but cool enough to drink. While we waited I explained that I'd read during some research I'd done on an assignment years before at university that during World War II, there was a famous Australian doctor who was a prisoner of war in Changi prison who saved his fellow prisoners from dying of food poisoning by treating them with baking soda and the three cups with a spoon in each was his cure. At least it was worth a try. It was hard drinking it knowing I'd be vomiting again, but what would happen if I didn't would be much worse. I drank the first cup knowing that as soon as it reached my stomach, it would be straight back up. And it did. Into a waiting receptacle. The second cup went down and sat in my stomach for a brief moment before it returned to the outside world with a vengeance as well. Then the third cup was swallowed and the nurse waited for the explosive vomit to appear except it didn't. She asked, what happened to it? Why haven't you vomited? No more vomiting and I'll be out of here soon I hope. It's gotta work. Nothing else seems to be helping. I could see the questioning expression on her face and said, I have no idea how it works, it just does. It worked in the Japanese prisoner of war camp and I'm praying it still works now. Your doctor won't be back for two days, so let's see how you go. If your loving wife phones instead of coming up, I'll tell her you're in a bad way and totally bedridden. Maybe the guilt will make her see the light. I just finished speaking and the nurse's brother walked into my room. I looked up at him, and he held out his arm, and we shook hands. Janet then phoned saying she was visiting tourist sites and wouldn't be back up as we planned. She thought she'd be too tired again after dinner. Once she said that I only heard blah, 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 blah as she told me where she intended to go. I explained to the investigator what I was scared was happening, and we discussed what we could do to confirm or disprove my worst fears and he smiled when I told him the hotel room was booked in my name. We decided he should plant hidden cameras throughout our suite straight away, while she was out visiting tourist landmarks during the afternoon, and he'd follow them over the next few days. As luck would have it I still had my swipe card for the hotel suite in my wallet, so he could gain easy entry while my wife was out. 
An hour or so later, he phoned to say the cameras were installed. He was quick and obviously knew his work. After that, he stayed at the hotel and waited for my wife to come back then secretly videoed them from his secluded spot. He then phoned me again and told me they'd gone to separate rooms to get changed for dinner. I was really worried about Janet being near that sleaze and I tried to phone her numerous times, but she didn't pick up. After a while, her phone was turned off. I tried to get out of my bed but was too weak and collapsed. I had to save her. I still felt like shit, but at least I didn't vomit again. I felt a needle prick in my arm and any thoughts of saving my bride were lost as I sank into a deep drug-induced sleep. I must have been out all night and when I woke all I could do was think about not being able to stop that predator screwing my wife. Maybe I should have spent my money on someone who would have made sure he couldn't get near her. I wanted to get up to try to save what was left of my marriage, but I was strapped to the bed. I just kept on struggling until the nurses noticed and sedated me again. When I awoke my friendly nurse was on shift, and she released me from my restraints and cleaned me up. I asked if Janet had been up to see me, and she checked the visitor's book and couldn't see her name since I'd seen her get into the taxi with that sleaze, but she did say Janet had phoned the last two days about lunchtime. The doctor finally showed up and was amazed I hadn't thrown up again, and the nurse told him I'd taken the baking soda. He'd never heard of it being used before and asked a lot of questions I couldn't answer except the most important one. I hadn't vomited since. He said I needed to stay a few days longer to regain some strength and warned me if I tried to leave I'd be restrained as I was still too weak to even walk. I told my nurse I still had to rescue my bride, but I could already see a pained look in her eyes. I didn't want her to tell me, but I knew what was coming when she said her brother had evidence of her infidelity. Her lover had even moved into our room, and the sex had been almost nonstop. It was too late, and she held me while I cried on her shoulder. My marriage was over without even having been consummated. I had her note on my file at reception saying there was no change in my condition and I was sedated. I was gaining a little strength by the hour as I started to eat limited amounts of steamed rice and dry toast. The final lab test came back and confirmed the chicken I had eaten had been tampered with a highly unusual strain of botulism. It was man-made in a laboratory in my home state and had been developed years ago for germ warfare. My doctor then told me that the police and other interested agencies in my home state had been sent a full report and they were waiting for my return. As I gained my strength I set about straightening my life up. Janet had totally ceased visiting and no longer phoned after she'd been told that day I'd be discharged in time for our flight home. I still couldn't even get her on her phone and even left messages at the hotel reception. I really missed her and by now all the nurses knew what had happened and looked after me. One of my new friend's close co-workers, another nurse, came in one day and told me her father was a divorce lawyer in my hometown and she phoned him while she was with me. She told him I was a good friend and had been poisoned at my wedding and the culprit had stolen my bride. It seemed my bride no longer cared for me and I wanted a divorce. I interrupted then and told her we'd signed a prenup in which if proven, the unfaithful partner would only walk away with a little more than their clothes. It was harsh one. Her father had insisted I sign it to protect their family interests, but Janet had insisted on signing it as well. I didn't have a copy with me but could get one to him as soon as I returned home. I could almost hear him smiling. My private investigator visited to give me his regular briefing and to let me know he'd sent copies of what he'd recorded to my lawyer. I could see he was upset and I asked him if there was a problem. His response made me think a little. Because you're still in here, I've sent copies of everything to your lawyer then phoned him and told him to pay particular attention to some of it. When I said I was coming over to see you, he asked me to let you know he was ready and waiting. I was checking on the recordings before I sent them. I hate doing it now because I know what it means to most marriages. Look, I wished I'd paid more attention on that first night. He drugged her, you know. I don't understand how I missed it at the time. If I'd seen him do it, I would have rescued her. By the way she was flirting with him, I honestly thought they'd already had sex. I confirmed it all when I watched the recording when he phoned his brother and told him how successful the whole thing had been. In the recording he's boasting that what they put in your chicken worked great and they'd have to get some more from their cousin while he's still working at the laboratory. He's under the impression the doctors didn't have a clue so they're going to use it again real soon on another couple. Only it'll be his brother's turn to get the bride. Anyway, it left Janet vulnerable and then he drugged her after convincing her to have dinner with him. Shit, the scumsucker was even raving about how he'd even got her cherry. 
I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. The thing is, he only used it on her the once. Since that first time she's been insatiable and can't get enough sex from him. I've got a separate DVD here of his admission of your poisoning for you to pass on to the police. I can send it to them if you like. My sisters told me the police already have the medical and lab results and are waiting for you to return to give your statement and of course this recorded confession then they'll arrest and charge him and his brother. When they track down their cousin he talks about, he'll be arrested as well if the feds don't get to him first. When I told your lawyer about the poison, he told me he'd start on the paperwork to have it ready to sue the catering company for contaminating your food, not that it'll save your marriage. He's also got the paperwork ready for you to sign when you get home to proceed with your divorce. If you were thinking of forgiving her, you need to be aware they've planned to keep on meeting and keeping their affair going. She told him she wouldn't leave you for him because she still loved you. In any case, he's married and his wife's family owns the catering company, so I'm sure he would be dumping Janet when he gets bored. You know your wife planned to get pregnant during your honeymoon. It has something to do with a fortune her grandmother left her in her will that had conditions attached. It only gets worse when you listen to them talking about maybe her already being pregnant and you raising his kid. I knew he was trying to help me, but every time he opened his mouth to bring me up to date it only got worse. I had no reason to doubt what he said, and it only made me more distressed. Then he did it again when he added, The scumsucker is even wearing your clothes now. Your wife told him he should to improve his image. All I could do was shake my head knowing I'd never wear those clothes anymore just as I knew I'd never touch Janet again. Some strength returned much quicker than anticipated, so I thanked everyone for their support and assistance then discharged myself. I booked myself on the first available flight home and caught a taxi to the airport. There was no one to meet me when I flew in. No one was expecting me and certainly not without my beautiful bride. Without Janet and her family around me, I was alone in the world again. I'd already moved all my clothes into the mansion Janet's parents had given us as a wedding present so I went there. On my way home. What a joke that was. What home? I phoned my lawyer asking him if he could call over to my house in the morning so that I could sign everything he needed. It had been a long hard day, and although I didn't think I'd be able to sleep I soon nodded off while watching some television. The next thing I knew I was awakened by shouts and being roughly manhandled to the floor. I was kicked and punched while I curled up on the floor trying to escape what was happening to me. They handcuffed me then read me my rights and I was being charged with so much. I couldn't believe it. I'd done nothing wrong. Just sleep in my house. They said they were charging me with breaking and entering, trespassing, and when they could find what I'd stolen there'd be theft added as well. Every time I tried to speak I was kicked hard and told to shut up. All was quiet for a moment then I heard one of the police ask someone if they knew me or had seen me around before. I couldn't see her but I knew her voice straight away as she demanded they throw the book at me for what I'd done. At the same time, I heard another familiar voice over near the door asking to come in. I was kicked again then felt a policeman under each arm then they roughly dragged me to my feet. I heard Debbie gasp then my lawyer explode as he read the riot act to all the police in attendance. He's the owner you morons, he screamed. I'll have all your badge numbers. You're all in deep shit. Why have you cuffed and assaulted him? Debbie was crying and ran towards me. The police let me go and I dropped to the floor still hurting from the numerous heavy kicks I'd received. There was a deathly silence as I heard my lawyer obviously on his phone demanding to be put through to the police commissioner. I heard muttering all around me and quiet swearing under their breaths as my cuffs were removed far more gently than they'd been applied. They tried to pick me up again but I screamed in agony from some obviously badly hurt ribs. Debbie was screaming hysterically not to hurt me as I pleaded for no one to touch me. She was leaning over me crying and telling me Janet was frantically looking for me in Hawaii and she'd phone her to tell her she'd found me. I was feeling quite faint probably caused by the kick to my head but I managed to reach up and grab her arm and beg her to tell no one I was back and if she wanted the reason to watch the DVD, sitting in front of the television, and talk to my lawyer. I couldn't finish what I wanted to say as everything went black about me, yet again. In my semi-conscious state, I could hear the beeping around me, and I prayed everything had been a bad nightmare, and I still had my honeymoon ahead of me. Was it Janet holding my hand ever so gently? and were they her tears I could feel on my hand that was held to her cheek? Slowly I opened my eyes and had trouble becoming accustomed to the bright fluorescent lights above me. 
I could already feel my chest strapped from where I'd been repeatedly kicked. As my other senses slowly kicked and I could hear whoever it was sitting next to me whispering over and over, I'm so sorry, James. Please forgive me for what I've done. It shouldn't have happened. James, my God, what VE I done? I began to recall the worst two weeks of my life and wondered if my loving wife had finally found me and was begging for my forgiveness. Wait, the perfume was wrong and her voice was much gentler. It wasn't Janet. My eyes finally opened and before I could focus she jumped up and started yelling, He's awake. He's awake. I saw it was Debbie beside me still holding my wet hand and her cheek was red from holding my hand against it. I looked around and saw my lawyer. I remembered his face from the photos his daughter had shown in hospital and from seeing him at my house. Then I closed my eyes and sighed as I remembered the pain I had woken to God knows how long ago now. I heard a mad scramble and felt hands on me and a bloody cold stethoscope. Someone was pulling my eyelids up and shining a stinking bright light into my eyes. I could hear the heart monitor beeping steadily beside me so I knew I was alive. Why couldn't they leave me alone? I'd have to remember not to sigh again if that was to be the result. Slowly they pulled back away from me. When I opened my eyes and looked around the room seemed nearly full, but I only recognized two of them. Debbie was still crying as she introduced my lawyer to me then he took over and did the honors. My treating doctor was first and there was a nurse who'd be in my room the whole time until I recovered. The state was picking up the bill. Next came the police commissioner and then the district attorney and because my lawyer suggested I already feared for my life after a very recent poisoning attempt, they even introduced the two police who'd be stationed at my door until I recovered. In truth, it was all very chaotic. Then there was silence for a few moments with the only sound being that of Debbie still crying and the heart monitor beating away steadily, thank goodness. At least that was reassuring. The police commissioner broke the silence and approached me saying he wanted to apologize on behalf of the police department for the actions of a few, very overzealous men. Then he happened to mention that he was having a hard time dealing with the knowledge of what his son had done. I was sure he didn't want assault charges brought against his men. I wasn't sure why the district attorney was in the room until he said they were keen to finalize the paperwork to set the arrest of the two brothers and their cousin in motion, but they still needed my signed statement. My lawyer stepped in and read me a prepared statement we discussed while I was still in Hawaii, so I quickly signed it and the DA left. The doctor was called away and the two police followed him out the door but then stationed themselves each side of the doorway. When everything settled I finished signing all the documents my lawyer required. He'd found my copy of our prenup on the floor next to where I'd gone to sleep the night before. I'd been reading it. I whispered some suggestions to my lawyer and as he heard them he just kept nodding with that silly grin on his face. The police commissioner had made a slight error in judgment in apologizing for his son, who'd been one of the uniformed police who'd attacked me, and was obviously concerned now, for both their careers, if I went public about the police attacking me in my home, totally unprovoked. We closed the door for some privacy, and offered some suggestions to the worried father. None were outrageous, but nevertheless he agreed to see if it was possible with his political and legal connections. I didn't want much and I wouldn't sue them if I was able to obtain a very quick divorce and I wanted to inflict maximum pain and jail time on the two brothers. If that didn't happen my PI in Hawaii had suggested he'd like to help me out as he still felt a bit responsible. Debbie stayed with me all that first day and night hardly leaving my side. She refused even when I suggested she go home and change. Several times Janet phoned her in tears saying that she still hadn't found me. She'd even mentioned that my luggage was still in our room. While she cried, Debbie confessed to me it was her who'd called the police. She'd visited the house like she did every morning to make sure all was secure. When she arrived, she'd seen the mess in the kitchen I'd left and a couple of beer bottles on the floor. My arm was draped over the end of the lounge, and without seeing who I was, she called the police who'd overreacted. Of course, I forgave her as she held my hand to her cheek again. On one occasion, as Debbie had her phone on loudspeaker when Janet spoke to her, I heard the sleaze bag murmur something in the background. I muted the phone then asked Debbie to ask Janet who the man was in her room who was talking in the background. Janet's phone quickly disconnected, but then she phoned back minutes later, saying the signal must have dropped out. This time there was no noise behind her. In the morning my lawyer was back. Somehow I think he was enjoying a case that held so much variety. 
He confirmed the state officials had agreed in principle to grant the divorce at the first sitting that day based on the evidence we held, the prenup and my attempted murder. Maybe the attempted murder was exaggerated more than a little, but that was the charge we wanted the brothers prosecuted on. Although it held no stead, the fact that our marriage had never been consummated and she'd continuously cheated on me while I lay near death in hospital had been taken into account. On top of all that she declared her intent to keep cheating and have the sleazebags children. Then he left for court to see if the state would keep its word. He was back well before lunch with my final decree of divorce and suggested Debbie fetch her father without giving reason or destination until he was here with us so the situation could be explained to him. His reputation for explosive reactions to certain situations was well documented. Debbie agreed and left to get her father knowing it was going to be very difficult to get him to our hospital room. She texted me when she was leaving his office with him in hot pursuit, and when they arrived our room was darkened with the blinds closed. We could see he wasn't a very happy man, and we had no idea what Debbie had told him to follow her. The police at the door had him worried. The police had been briefed to let them in without stopping them, and as their eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw the look of surprise on his face. We could easily see he was about to explode, so my lawyer quickly intervened and asked him to sit and listen then he could ask his questions. My lawyer was good and I wondered how much I was going to end up paying. I'd never asked and he'd never said anything. I was surprised when Debbie sat next to me on the bed and held my hand, and as her father sat he shot an evil look at both of us. So then my lawyer proceeded to bend the truth a little, but it was sort of based on fact. Besides it sometimes went with the profession I'm told. My father-in-law, well ex-father-in-law now, was quickly told that I was under police protection as the authorities feared for my life after having been deliberately poisoned at my wedding. I could see the look of horror on his face. He continued and told him that while I lay near death on my hospital bed my loving wife had stopped visiting me and I couldn't even get her on the phone while she proceeded to cheat with the man who'd poisoned me. Our marriage had never been consummated, and now she was going to probably say she was pregnant to claim her grandmother's huge inheritance. Debbie's father just sat there shaking his head in disbelief, then Debbie told him she'd seen the DVD evidence of her betrayal of me and listened to their plans to cuckold me well into the future. He sounded defeated when he finally said, but Janet phoned every night telling us all how she was so worried about you and that you were very sick the whole time from a virus. She said she'd stayed by your side the whole time. Then the other day, she rang in panic saying you just disappeared from hospital while she was away, and no one could find you. We were going to fly out to help her, but she insisted we meet her here as she had a friend who was going to help her there. She was sure you'd show up before it was time to leave. She even suggested you might have even been a little delirious. She's flying home tomorrow using the return ticket hoping you'll be by her side. My lawyer continued, You need to understand that Janet wasn't part of the conspiracy to poison James and is as much of a victim here, but sadly she has committed adultery and continued with her infidelity on a daily basis, completely ignoring James and his near-death situation. Both James and the hospital tried to make contact with Janet in the days before he was released, but she didn't respond to their calls, so he flew home not knowing where she was anymore. As such, the state has made special provision and allowed their divorce to be finalized based on their prenup. They're no longer married. Here's some of the photographic evidence taken, and you can see its date and time stamped, so you can see her behavior was not a once-only or very occasional thing. I suggest you don't look at them. My ex-father-in-law looked over at me with a look of sadness I'll never forget, but then cocked his head the same way Janet did that first time as he looked at Debbie holding my hand. Are you two? No. We responded together. Debbie discovered me at home when I got back from Hawaii, and she stayed with me and helped me through some painful situations over the past few days while I've been hospitalized. Without her, God knows what would have happened to me. She's been like my guardian angel that Janet should have been. Debbie, I need to ask a big favor of you, honey. Can you stay close to James and look after him for us? Our family owes him so much for what your sister has done. I'm not sure we'll ever get around her total disrespect and lies to all of us. I'll have to talk to your mother and warn her so she doesn't collapse when she finds out what's happened and what Janet's going to find when she gets home. I spoke again. Please let Janet stay with you at your house. There's court order forbidding her coming near me because of her association with the caterer while I was sick. Remember she was drugged to start with and then taken advantage of. 
I'm so sorry, but because of her actions and her blatant infidelity, I can never stay married to her. If it had only been the once with that dirtbag when he drugged her, it would have been different, and I would have somehow forgiven her. But over the past couple of weeks, she has totally destroyed my trust in her. I'll never forget how much I loved her. While they were talking about what had happened, a nurse came in and injected something into my drip, then I must have drifted off to sleep. When I awoke, it was morning and the others were gone, of course, but Debbie was still beside me sleeping peacefully in a big old armchair someone had found for her. We still had quite some time to go before Janet's plane arrived, so I let Debbie sleep. I somehow knew she'd been awake late into the night, just sitting there watching me every time I twitched or moved a little. The police commissioner arranged for us to be present when the sleazebag was arrested, and that of course meant we'd be there when Janet was served her papers. The commissioner's driver with his car picked us up and dropped us at the main entrance to be met by the head of airport security, his cousin. As we walked in with Debbie supporting me a little, we were escorted to the mezzanine floor to wait for the show. Strange how after all the times I'd been there over the years, I'd never noticed the mezzanine floor before. It blended in extremely well with the building design and was a security feature after September 11th. Although all the glass was mirrored if viewed by the general public below in effect, they were one-way mirrored glass on sliding window tracks. The concept was to provide some additional safety without the public realizing they were being watched and monitored the whole time they were in the terminal. While we waited we were given a quick guided tour but by the end I found I could barely take another step and was pushed in a wheelchair after that. I wasn't as recovered as I thought I was and I was sure the beating from the police hadn't helped. We watched as their parents entered the terminal and waited quietly in the arrivals lounge. Debbie went down to meet them and spoke for a few moments to let them know Janet would be delivered her divorce documents as soon as she was in the lounge. Debbie also let them know I was watching from a wheelchair from above. As I watched her mother put her hand to her mouth, I was unsure of what part of the conversation she responded to. I had a feeling it was that I was in a wheelchair because she already knew about the papers. Soon it was showtime and Debbie rejoined me as we watched the two lovers enter the terminal from the plane tunnel together. Before they were in view of the public, they hugged and kissed and obviously said quick goodbyes. As they separated, police descended on him and he foolishly tried to resist. Janet watched in horror as he was tasered then cuffed and dragged away, kicking and screaming that he'd done nothing wrong. A far less confident Janet made her way to the arrivals lounge to pick up her luggage. I'd already been told by my PI in Hawaii they'd left mine at the hotel reception. What a loving wife, but by now I expected no less after two weeks of her lover's companionship. She even let him take what clothes he wanted to keep. The scumsucker had even worn my favorite shirt home. As she entered the lounge, she saw her mother waving and made her way towards them. Just before she reached them a well-dressed woman stepped in front of her, and I flicked on my small receiver and listened. We heard the woman asking her if she was Janet Thomas, then we heard Janet reply that she was as she nodded. It was obvious from the questioning tone in her voice, she didn't have a clue what was about to happen. Their mother and father knew what was happening and held each other for support. It was a terrible thing to happen in a close family even in this day and age. The server continued, Janet Thomas, you have been served with the final decree of divorce confirming the dissolution of your marriage on the grounds of infidelity. The state has granted James Thomas's request for a divorce and based on your signed prenup has awarded him all your joint property and bank accounts apart from $10,000 and your clothing and motor vehicle. The court's decision is final and irrevocable. Good day. This was the final moment in what was left to my marriage and even after what she'd done to me I found I had tears in my eyes as Janet opened the envelope obviously still uncertain what she'd just been told. I bit my bottom lip and we watched her read the covering letter from the court. Debbie squeezed my hand as I stood up, and we opened the window in front of us. The movement of the window caught her father's attention, then both her parents looked up at us as I wiped my tears away. I heard Janet cry out in anguish as she suddenly realized what had happened and looked at her parents for support. Realizing they weren't watching her, she followed their gaze and saw Debbie and I standing together looking back at her. Then she collapsed. Terminal staff raced to Janet, and she was stretchered to a nearby sick room to recover. Debbie still loved her sister and wanted to make sure she was okay before we returned to hospital and wheeled me to where she was resting. Their parents were with her as she cried, pleading with them that she didn't deserve what I'd done to her. 
Debbie went in and joined them and coldly welcomed her home and told her she'd catch up later. Just as she was leaving, Debbie turned to Janet and said, Your lover was the one who poisoned James. He almost died while you betrayed him every day. She turned back to the door, and as she passed her mother and father kissed them both on their cheeks. As Debbie pushed my wheelchair past the door, I saw Janet watching us, then we heard her scream out, James, please come back. I didn't know. Please, I still love you. James, please. Her father restrained her so she couldn't chase after us. Debbie didn't leave my bedside for more than a few minutes at a time after that. It was another week in hospital until I was released, and before I left I was told the brothers and their cousin weren't granted bail at their hearing. It seems the sleaze bag who'd screwed Janet was delivered his divorce papers while he was waiting for trial. My lawyer had been to see his wife and given her enough evidence to get rid of him. Even their insurance company rolled over and settled quickly rather than face a far greater payout directed by a court. Back at my house, Debbie looked after me, and over the coming months as I steadily regained my weight and health. I soon realized I'd been right before I married when I'd thought Debbie and I were far more compatible. Unlike her sister, she made no demands and was happy to sit with me and watch a movie or even sit out and watch the stars together. Janet had wanted to be out all the time at some fancy restaurant or nightclub. While she was still looking after me, Debbie had to return to university but still stayed with me every night. She didn't need to go home every few days for more clothing as it was all in my guest room by then. She still attended the obligatory Wednesday night dinners at home every week. Although I'd been told I could take as much sick leave as I needed, as soon as I had clearance I returned to work. When I walked into the office you could have heard a pin drop, but it all soon settled down except no one knew quite what to say to me. They'd all heard through the grapevine what had happened and my short marriage was not a topic of conversation. I think more so from the fear of losing their jobs. Before lunch I received a phone call and was directed to attend a meeting with my ex-father-in-law. Although I was still treated like family, I hadn't been invited back to their house and I didn't expect to with Janet living there. I half expected to be terminated and told I was no longer wanted. Instead of the termination I expected, I was asked to come to dinner. After all, it was Wednesday. I reminded him that the restraining order on Janet was still in place then he told me she'd finally been admitted into a private clinic for treatment for depression caused by what she'd done and the catastrophic results to her life. She'd even had a miscarriage and lost her baby. Dinner was a little strained that night to start with as Debbie sat next to me in place of Janet. Janet's name wasn't mentioned at all, but I did get a lot of looks from their mother. Finally she spoke up, James, what are you plans now? We know you're not dating anyone else, and we only ever see Debbie now on Wednesday nights. You two have seemed very close since you know when, and we'd just like to say we're so sorry for what's happened and loved having you as part of our family. Although we might be jumping the gun a little, we'd really like you to stay part of our family if possible somehow. I could see she was flustered and getting caught up then she continued. I had my heart set on some grandchildren really soon, and then we thought that maybe you and Debbie might have developed an interest in each other. Then she turned bright red. I turned to Debbie and picked up her hand then said, I think your mother wants me to get you pregnant. Would you like to start practicing tonight? From the grin on my face, everyone knew I was joking. I hoped. Debbie responded, James, you know I promised my parents I'd be a virgin on my wedding night, so if you want to make babies in me, we'll have to be married. I'd expected some light joking response from Debbie, but not quite the one I received. The whole table was quiet as if waiting for my answer. My mind was spinning at a million miles an hour. My proposal to Janet had been well thought out, but Debbie and I had become best friends while she looked after me. We'd even spent long hours telling each other our dreams and likes and dislikes. We'd come close several times to doing the deed, but we'd been able to stop every time. It was so nice to be with her, and I loved just lying next to her holding her listening to her breath. Then it struck me. We were more than best friends and were so compatible. Right at that moment, I just realized how much I'd grown to love her. Maybe it was just on the rebound, but I doubted that. It seemed I loved her even more than I'd loved her sister. It felt like everyone had sat there for an hour waiting for my retort, but it was only about a minute. A very long life, changing 60 seconds or so. I turned to her parents, then licked my dry lips. I even think I may have been shaking a little, then I finally said, Well, I suppose if you both want me to stay in the family and you want grandchildren that must mean you'd be happy for me to ask Debbie to marry me. 
Her mother burst into tears and replied, Please, we like that. I didn't have a ring to give her right then and there, but I turned to Debbie and asked her to marry me without another moment's thought. Of course we kissed as soon as she accepted. Then her mother added, The same rules apply to you as apply to your sister for the inheritance. Let's go work out a date. Then the three females left. Her father could see I was puzzled and was standing to leave the table to escape my next question that he knew was coming. I stood as well and followed him out onto the veranda. I've heard of this inheritance before and have wondered if it was one of the reasons Janet betrayed me so easily. I knew she was keen to fall pregnant our honeymoon. In fact, we'd often joked about it. While we're asking difficult questions, you know, sometimes I felt like she'd picked me out to be her husband for that reason. Is there any truth in that? He didn't answer so I continued. I know she said she loved me and all but in the end I have to wonder if I was just there to inseminate her on our honeymoon because she liked me when we first met. You know it's recorded where she's saying she's hoping she's pregnant by her lover while I was unavailable in hospital. I hope Debbie isn't being influenced by the same inheritance dangling in front of her. Then there was silence. Finally he answered, My mother was extremely wealthy in her own right and when she died left her fortune to the three girls on condition they complied with several conditions. The first that they be virgins when they marry, and they do have to get checked the day of their wedding. The second is that they have a baby within nine months of their honeymoon, and the third is they name the baby after my mother or father. If they failed all or any of the three conditions the inheritance drops from $10 million to $1 million. So when we saw Janet's behavior we wondered, just like you probably are now. Janet won't be left destitute by the way. She'll receive $1 million after she satisfies the third condition, but you can't help but wonder if she went all out for the $10 million and just made use of a bad situation. We're so sorry about that. We didn't see it when you married and thought Janet had a genuine love for you. Debbie's different to her sister, but I'm sure you've worked that out. It's like there's a strong bond between the both of you already just waiting to be formalized in marriage. We've seen Debbie when she's with you. You know she never stops watching you. Her eyes are on you the whole time. There's more to my mother's will, but you'll have to wait. I'm not permitted to discuss any more. Of course the prenup is expected again you understand. What he just told me had potentially answered some questions, but also created some many more. I was about to ask further, but his cell phone rang and he whispered he had to take it. Just then the females appeared and seemed full of beans, or maybe it was just the champagne they were drinking too much of. Debbie came up beside me, and held me close then we locked lips for a few minutes. Her mother jokingly said, God, you two get a room will you? I had an idea and turned to Debbie and whispered, You heard your mother. I think she wants us to start making her grandchildren right away. Let's go to your room for the night and start. I started to lead her away. Deep down I had a need to test Debbie to see if she wanted me or a chance for the big inheritance. Almost like a game of chicken with two cars heading towards each other at high speed. I needed to know if she'd give it up for me. Debbie didn't object, but then she responded. You already know I've promised my parents I'd wait till my wedding night. I suspect dad's told you about the inheritance already and what it's worth and the conditions, but you know I want more than anything else to spend the rest of my life with you. We're throwing a lot away, but if that's what you want then I want it as well. Let's go. She turned to her parents and wished them good night. We walked inside the house as her mother's eyes went wide like saucers and her mouth opened but no sound came out. I stopped and turned to Debbie as we passed through the door and I kissed her again then quietly declared, Deb, you promised your parents and that's obviously something important to them. On top of that you were happy to lose your inheritance for me but that's not fair to you so we'll wait for our wedding night. Just don't make it too far away please. You're so desirable but I'll wait. Then we locked lips again as I held her close. Epilogue three months later we were married. Debbie signed our prenup as well to confirm her belief in our future which only made me wonder further about Janet's true feelings about me after all. Janet attended with the new man in her life and wished us well. She'd had an excellent psychologist and the therapy had been good for her. They're a good match for each other and planning their wedding for some time in the next year. We'd managed to wait for our wedding night and almost nine months later Elaine Marjorie Thomas made her entrance a week or two early. We'd only just got Elaine home when her grandmother visited, to help out of course and started asking what our plans were for her next grandchild. My parents would have loved Elaine and I only wished my mother could have had the chance to hold my little girl and spoil her as she grew up. 
I just knew they would have been so close. At times when I was watching Elaine, I could see my mother smile and I knew that my mom was sharing precious moments with her granddaughter. At Elaine's first Wednesday night appearance, a few weeks later at the in-laws, we were surprised the family lawyer was there as a guest and after dinner handed Deb the account details for $10 million. Just when we thought it was all finished, we were staggered when I was given 10% of the shares of their family company and made a vice president as part of the inheritance. It only got better when I reminded myself that this time, I was definitely married to the right sister. Subscribe to the channel or your loved one will cheat on you. If you like this story, make sure to watch the next one on the channel. We'll catch you hopefully in our next video, thank you.